Fran, present. Town of Sawadita. Beth Abramovitz, present. Town of Oro Valley. De Rodriguez, present. Ada, Tucson District. Rod Lane, present. Tohono Odom Nation. Patricia Pablo, I'm here. Pasquayaki. Jason Bahi here. City of South Tucson. City of Tucson. Robin Rain here. Pima County. Uh, Ana Olivares is here. Then we have other agencies, ADOT Transportation Planning Division. Mark Hoffman here. present. Tucson Airport Authority. Suntran. Davide Mueller, Suntran. University of Arizona. Mark Novak, present. Pima County DEQ. And TO Nation, San Javier District. And hopefully I didn't miss anyone. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item is the in-kind reporting. Hey, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, we do like to read this. So bear with us. Um, regional planning efforts are enhanced by recording time donated by attendees, volunteers, and participants. PAG collects data on the time dedicated to meetings and activities to apply for use as matching funds for grants and federal dollars. If you are paid with federal dollars, please let us know. Time spent in preparation for this meeting will be estimated by PAG staff who are knowledgeable of the agenda and meeting materials. At the conclusion of this meeting, the session report will automatically calculate your time spent in this meeting. Time spent working on PAG RTA initiatives, programs, and special projects may also be eligible for consideration for matching funds. That's all I've got, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, next item is the uh, approval of the January 19th meeting minutes. If anybody's had a chance to review those, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, the motion is, uh, it's been motioned and seconded. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye, please. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. Next item is item number four in the agenda is the election of the TPC chair and vice chair. Are there any volunteers? If not, we'll move to nominations. Mr. Vice Chair, this is Anna. Yes. So I would nominate our current vice chair to be chair okay. for the committee, Keith. Is there a second? Pat, I'll second that. Second. <laughs> Motion's been, it's been moved and seconded for uh, myself to become the chair, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, oppo any opposed? Hearing none, I am now the chair, I assume. Mm -hmm. uh, next would be motions for vice chair. Anyone nominating one for the vice chair? Mr. Chair, yes. I nominate Ana Lovatis, Department of Transportation, as vice chair. Oh, say. I will <laughs> second that. <laughs> It has been motioned and seconded. Is there any uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, Ana Olivares is now vice chair. Okay, we will move forward to the next item. Item number five, review of the TABI grants for FY22. Uh, unfortunately, my agenda is the regular agenda. I don't have the secret agenda, so I don't know who is presenting which item. Uh, that'll be me, Carolyn Laurie. Good morning, Mr. Chair and yes, um, Madam 
Vice Chair. Um, um, good morning, committee. This morning, we have two applications for the Transportation Art by Youth um, program this year. Our first presenter will be from the town of Oro Valley, um, and her that will be Amy Ramsey. Um, can we please move forward to the, thank you. Amy? Good morning. Uh, this is exciting. I think I have control of the slides. So real simple presentation. Um, my first for the Tabby grant, uh, even though this is our third up uh, since I've had uh, the privilege of managing this program, our third go at it. Uh, last year we skipped because of COVID and we're looking forward to this year. I do not have control. So can we advance to the next slide? If you go ahead and just click on the slide, you should be good to go. There you go. There we go. So just a brief overview of what our timeline will uh, be like. Back in December, we entered into an agreement with SACA. When we do this, they do our overall uh, administration. And I'll go through that partnership later on in the presentation. And then a brief overview of the remaining timeline on should we be successful in getting our money? Next uh, month, we'll start getting uh, the artist on board, then the students on board in April. Students uh, will start doing the concepts. So my hardest part about this whole application is when it comes to describing the art and what you're looking for, because we really, really have a two-way process uh, with the students. We bring them in, they conceptualize, what do they think, we pick a theme, and we move forward. Then, of course, June, July will be where they build it. Uh, and we have to get them done by June, July, end of July, so that they can get back into school in August. And then we do a nice little uh, kickoff and dedication process, uh, which we enjoy, invite the family, the friends, and uh, it's a good time. Uh, so this year, we're looking for a little bit of functional art. Uh, the two prior years, uh, we've done the entrance to our community center, and we did the quails, the entrance to Naranja Park. This year, we're looking to build uh, some art along Tangerine that we think can promote some alternate modes along the pedestrian pay, uh, trail there and the bicycle path, because we are wanting to support our walkable communities along uh, major corridors. If any of you guys travel along that beautiful Tangerine that was built, always, always, uh, except for days like today, there are always people on that uh, those paths, and I love it. Uh, of course, and it builds a uh, youth pride in the community. They can pass by, they can pass by 20 years from now and say, hey, I was part of that process. Uh, just a little overview of our budget breakdown. We provide this every year. It doesn't change much. Uh, the $75,000 doesn't change at all. We do roll over our three years to produce it. A lot of the funding going to uh, the wages mm -hmm. and the studies, a little bit going to SACA for the administration, uh, materials and supplies. Uh, depending on the artwork, sometimes vary and will uh, reduce the amount of administration. I think uh, we were a little shocked at how much the um, quails were coming in at, but got that done within budget and on time. So uh, loved that project. Some of the things I mentioned, the soccer uh, partnership with us. And so they start from the get-go, developing the scope and the vision. Um, then they go through and administer the call to the artist, work through us, they give us the applications, we select those. They facilitate all the student applications. They do everything basically for us. We, met, we meet with them regularly, uh, we manage the budget, uh, they do all the procurement, uh, and then they even uh, work with us on planning the ceremony and the project rollout and the final summary. So it's very, uh, much a very strong relationship. It's worked well for us. Uh, for at least I've worked. I've worked with them. I don't know whether the town of Oro Valley and uh, Jose may have some actually background on this. It's so before I took over, but for the past uh, several projects, couple projects, they have been very near and dear to my heart. So some of the ideas and concepts we're thinking, as I said, functional, a place to sit, a place to rest. Uh, these are two projects that we have built in the past um, in our area that would allow a bicycle list or a pedestrian just to sit, enjoy the area, relax, fix a flat tire, uh, but very much, you know, provides a shelter and a place to sit. 
the proposed location, uh, the location we have is along Tangerine. Tangerine was recently uh, upgraded through RTA funds and it was a multi-jurisdictional project. We don't have any art along this corridor. Um, there's no refuge. So our location here selected by our uh, engineer, Jose, a uh, nice area is between, it's a tangerine between Mesquite Sunset Place and Como Drive. Uh, we think it'd be uh, a nice place. As you can see from the uh, presentation, it's right next to the MUP. So it provides that little space um, and that continuity. That's all I have, unless you guys have questions. Are there any questions on this, uh, this proposal? Okay. Is, is PAG staff looking for us to take individual votes on these items one by one, or you want to look for us at the end to do a package vote? We were hoping to do, traditionally we do a package vote at the end, Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay. Okay. So the, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. John Garcia. He is presenting for the town of Sarita today. John? Hi, thank you. This is my first time addressing uh, T your group, so sorry if I'm a little nervous, but I will do my best. Um, I've been with the town since 2007, and roughly since 2007, I've been helping with the Youth Art program. Um, we came up with the Sarita Unified School District, Sarita High School, and we do a yearly IGA, depending on what the project is. Um, we do our work within June during their, their summer school, which is the month of June. Um, an art teacher, one or two, depending on what uh, the scope of the project and what we're doing. But the, we've been limited in what we can do. Uh, they have tile work, and that's mostly what we've done. Um, we're, this year, we're potentially branching out with uh, painting. Um, and you'll see what I say. If I can advance this thing. It says I have control. <laughs> OK. And I guess it's slow. So now I got to go back. Can you, can you go back on this? Oh, no, down here in the arrow is. So either there's a I, huge delay or so if we could I go can, back. I can control them for you. Thank you. So next slide, please. So Roughly, we have nine to 12 students that, that help them. And with the increasing minimum wage that's been happening in Arizona, that also changes the hours that are available. But again, we, we do it during the month of June. So we have to do everything in the month of June, Con conceptualize, go back and forth with the town of, uh, with ideas, and, and um, we create our, our works. For this year, we have uh, roughly 20 rest stations on both sides of La Cañada, beginning from the town boundary on the south side, and we almost have them up to the town boundary on the north side of La Cunata. So this project will complete um, having um, four more rest, drop, rest stops between El Toro and Sarita Road. Um, within this area, there is a dump, um, but there's also at the end of uh, uh, Sarita Road and, and La Cunata is where um, um, Ranch Resort, which is a, a senior living facility, and a lot of people come out of there and, and walk up and down in La Cunata. So having these extra four spots would be nice. Um, also within this area is, is Samtech, um, Sarita's, um, what's it called? Sorry, I don't have it. Sarita's Advanced Manufacturing and Technology Center, Samtech, um, which is helping to, to bring businesses to, to the town. Um, so there will be potentially a themed venture and can or in that area with uh, related to manufacturing, we'll see. For this year, we're gonna, I, when I went to Coeur d'Alene, my, my son lives in Coeur d'Alene, I saw decorated tra traffic signal cabinets and said, hmm, maybe that's something we could try and it's within the scope of what the students can do. Um, so with the, for this year, we're gonna try two different um, intersections, one at Pima Mine and the other at Old Nogales and White House Canyon, which is a new annex, annexation where La Posada is. Um, so you'll see in a couple of uh, slides, the location is uh, fairly, fairly visible. And the other, another reason we picked these slides is the signal cabinets are fairly new, so they won't be replaced for a while. Next slide, please. 
So here are the locations of where the signal cabinets are and, and the proposed locations along La Cunata between El Toro. Next slide, please. In general, th these are the process steps that, that we take. Um, I say June slash July. So June is when the students make everything. And then July is where we set, the, the, the town sets things in place. I don't really want to go over all the different steps unless you want me to. Otherwise, next slide. Here's an example of the, we have a local uh, concrete uh, person that um, Mikey's Concrete that has, initially we purchased these um, prefab benches uh, from Wisconsin and shipping was not fun. So we found a local person, local Mikey's Concrete and we work with them. They create the benches. Um, next slide, can you raise cans? This is how last year's, well, 2019's project worked because of COVID, we weren't able to do a couple. So now we have some um, funds sent, um, saved up and potentially next year, we might also use SACA as a first time to get outside of the box of the tile work that we've been um, limited to, if you want to say. Next slide. Just some examples of in process, generating the pictures, going back and forth, how they make the tiles, applying them. Next slide. And this is the after, so for the 2019 project, um, the North Veterans North Park, um, there's gonna be a Quail Creek extension. Um, it's in progress to go across uh, the Santa Cruz River and head towards a Brago, well, an, a Brago area, um, Brago Road, which will definitely in, uh, decrease the amount of traffic that goes up and down um, Old Nogales through the one way to get to the major shopping center along Nogales Highway. Um, so in 2019, we made four benches um, and there, one is sitting along Old Nogales and the other three are where the Quail Creek Extension will be. They'll be uh, extended out along the road. Right now they're by the park. Next slide. Here's some examples of um, painted traffic signal cabinets that I saw in Napa and in Port Link. Next slide. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I have a I have a question. Sure. The uh, the traffic signal cabinets. So those, uh, it looked like some of them. The examples might have been actually tiled themselves. But you're talking about only painting the cabinets. Well, they look like tiles, but it's they're all, everything is actually painted. That okay. that gray thing that's paint. Okay, I was just concerned about heat and uh, on the cabinets, but if it's just paint, then okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Um, Mr. Chair, I would like to just quickly state that the town of Oro Valley has requ requested their full $75,000 allocation for this TABI project. As Ms. Ramsey stated, they have banked their last three years of funding for that. The town of Sarita has opted to utilize $35,000 of their available funding and banking the $40,000 for a project in the near future. Okay, thank you. And with that, we ask um, for a motion. There's no further questions on these items, or is there a motion to approve these TABI grants? Motion to approve TABI grants. I second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded by Oro Valley and Sarita. <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing none, motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Mr. Chair, did you receive your chair's agenda this morning? I did. Thank you Thank very you. much. I okay. have it on. Okay. Great. Next item is item number six, a legislative update on proposed transportation related legislation. Uh, David Zinda. Yes, hello, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And thank you, members of the Transportation Planning Committee. It's a pleasure to speak to you as always, and I hope you're keeping warm on this uh, rough Arizona winter day. Um, you have to forgive me, it was very windy yesterday, so I'm a little bit sniffly, I think, with all that dust and stuff kicking up, but I'll try to make it through. All right, so as for legislative updates, we'll begin at the state level. Um, things are well underway as of this morning. It is day 38 of the second regular session of the 55th 
Arizona State Legislature. So we are about one third of the way through. As of today, there have been 1,672 bills um, introduced, quite a number. I think that's been monotonically increasing uh, since the history of this uh, uh, state. And I think we just celebrated our, what, 110th birthday, perhaps a couple days ago. So happy birthday, Arizona. With all those bills, though, we should not expect to see many more, if any, uh, as a deadline has passed for both the House and the Senate, which was on February 7th and January 31st, respectively, to submit new bills. January 18th, this Friday, is the last day for the House consideration of House bills and the Senate consideration of Senate bills. This means that if a bill does not go through a committee and have a hearing in the body from which it was introduced, the bill is likely not going to make it, at least not in this kind of normal form. After this week, the House will begin considering Senate bills and vice versa. Appropriation bills, however, do not follow this deadline. And many transportation bills actually fall under this category of general appropriations. However, we hope that these bills will still move expeditiously as any delay weakens the chances of realizing the funding in these bills via the budget. And that is the case. Appropriations bills, if, if successful, ultimately become included in the budget. They don't necessarily follow the path of normal legislation as we knew it. However, their passage through various committees is an indication that they are well on their way to be included in the state budget. An appropriations bill which is passed within its chamber of origin, even if the other chamber doesn't have much to do with it, still has a chance of final inclusion in the budget. With that in mind, here are a couple of bills that we are interested in, probably more than a couple actually. I'll start with transportation funding in general. House Bill 2263, um, would establish a transportation funding task force to address our needs for infrastructure going forward. Um, this was a bill from last year. It was assigned to the House Transportation Committee early in January, but had no hearing. So unfortunately, I don't think it's going to make it for another year. House Bill 2396 is a transportation appropriations bill. And this bill was uh, deeply influenced by the Rural Transportation Advisory Committee and consequently provides about 50 million to various projects in rural parts of Arizona. I believe the closest area that would be to us is in Nogales near Ruby Road. And although it doesn't affect the PAG region, it's still important to keep an eye on. Some legislative majority leadership have indicated only a desire to fund state highway projects, these bigger ones and not smaller jurisdictional rural ones. So it's certainly kind of a trend that we wanna keep an eye out for. Having that said, um, that complication. It has passed out of the House Transportation Committee, um, and we'll see where it goes. That's always a good sign. House Bill 2598 and Senate Bill 1356 are the transportation tax in Maricopa County. It is their version of the RTA. On the House side of things, um, it's passed out of the Transportation Committee. The Senate bill seems to have a little bit more momentum. Um, it is not only passed out of the Senate Transportation uh, Tech Committee, but it looks like this I think this afternoon, if not now as we speak, it's going to be considered on the Senate consent vote. So it'll bypass the typical floor debate and go straight to a vote. There has been some complications on this bill. In particular, uh, um, the trucking industry has been pushing back. They want to see about $90 million included in this RTA or somewhat different no nomenclature, this plan for um, truck parking. And it looks like they might be likely to get that. So we, we should certainly be grateful that our own RTA doesn't have to go through this process or who knows uh, um, what nice uh, trekking parking we might have as well. House Bill 2728 is another appropriations. This one is uh, could be a big deal for us. Um, it would fund tier two studies for a variety of projects, including providing 14 million for a tier two study for the Sonoran Corridor here in Pima County. Additionally, it would also provide 25 million for the proposed I-11 tier two study in Maricopa County and 19 million for the North-South Corridor in Pinal County. This bill will receive a hearing today at 1.30 p.m. in the House Transportation Committee. Should it pass, that will be a good sign of perhaps an eventual inclusion in the budget. Senate bill um, 1019 would affect the vehicle license tax sales price. And it would change that VLT to be calculated based on the actual sales price of the car and not the MSRP 
which is actually similar to another bill, Senate Bill 1148, introduced by the same senator, which more or less does the same thing with a couple of other technicalities. Um, this would reward the taxpayer who is, uh, can bargain for a deal on their car and get it under the MSRP, so they would pay less um, tax that way. This bill has had no scheduled hearings at all, so it likely is not going to make it unless it appears in the form of a striker, which we'll keep an eye out for. Um, Senate Bill 1192 is appropriations to do some, uh, add some vehicle lanes on I-10, mostly west of Phoenix, um, at the tune of $60 million going from State Route 85 to Citrus Road. Probably the one we might be more interested in is going to be Senate Bill 1239, which is uh, an appropriations bill to widen I-10 from Casa Grande to Chandler. This would be at the tune of about $400 million. Um, this bill has passed the Senate um, 27 yeas, one nay, and is now ready for the House. But once again, it's an appropriations bill, so uh, its eventual path will be a part of the budget discussion. Um, the governor has outlined this as a priority, so I'm not a soothsayer or an oracle, but you know, perhaps we will see some additional lanes eventually on uh, I-10 between uh, Phoenix and Casa Grande. House Bill 2701 affects the transaction privilege tax through prime contracting. Um, of course, this is a, a big deal for our RTA. Um, this bill isn't as drastic as some of the other ones that have been maybe introduced in the past, but it's essentially going to reduce the tax base for prime contracting classification of tr the transaction privilege taxes to 60% of the gross proceeds of sales or gross income derived from business or contracts um, entered in July 2023 through the next fiscal year. So that takes it from to 60% from 65%. And then after that initial year, it would take it down to 55%. This bill is currently undergoing a hearing now as we speak in the House Ways and Means Committee. So we'll keep an eye on that one as well. Turning now to just a, a couple more bills in transportation safety and technology. House Bill 2014 um, deals with safety features on autom autonomous vehicles. It would essentially prohibit if you drive like a level three, um, two or three autonomous vehicle for rigging the system with a defeat device to interfere or disable a safety feature to make it as if it were something like a fully autonomous vehicle um, with some exceptions. This bill has unanimously passed the House and is now ready for the Senate. House Bill 2586 um, deals with electric charging providers. Um, it says that electric charging providers that offer the use of specialized equipment for the purpose of charging batteries for electric vehicles are not subject to public service um, corporations and therefore not subject to regulation by the Corporation Commission. Functionally, this means they can charge fees and other pricing um, essentially how they see fit. Um, this has passed out of the committee and is now headed to the House caucus, where we'll have a discussion, followed by a vote by the House. Senate Bill 1150 um, would set up an EV pilot program. It is an appropriations bill. And essentially, it's going to see that counties and municipalities are prohibited from issuing residential structure building permits for single family structure. If that residential structure does not have the necessary infrastructure to accommodate electric vehicle charging outlet. The Department of Administration then would also be tasked to conduct a two-year electrical vehicle ready homes pilot program, which would reimburse the owner of a single family or multifamily residential structure, the cost of installing a high voltage electric outlet for the purpose of charging an electric vehicle, up to $1,000 until this appropriation is um, exhausted, which would be about $500,000 from the general fund. This bill has passed out of the committee and we wait to hear um, its progress, see if it's eventually in the budget. A couple more on the electric vehicles. Um, Senate Bill 1152, um, called Zero Emission Vehicles and Plans, which would mandate that um, in coordination with the Department of Environmental Quality and the Department of Administration, ADOT would be required to develop a zero emission vehicle plan designed to increase the number of registered zero emission vehicles in the state to at least 100,000 by 2028, and coordinate and increase the installation of zero emission vehicle infrastructure. Um, with this plan, it would report then to the governor and the legislature. This has passed out of the Senate um, yesterday, actually. Senate Bill 1154 would set up a transportation electrification study committee. 11 member panel that is to collaborate with local governments, electric utilities, environmental groups, 
and the transportation industry and other interested communities to identify the best ways to encourage an economy-wide transition from of course carbon fuel vehicles to electric vehicles and to submit a report then to the governor and the legislature by uh, July 1st, 2023. This is also passed out of the Senate um, yesterday. So a lot of exciting stuff happening with uh, some of these electric vehicle measures. Lastly, we have Senate Bill 1333, which concerns neighborhood occupantless vehicles, um, which of course doesn't have a human element uh, in it, unless you consider that chicken sandwich on a rough day that is bearing uh, headed your way as a friend. Um, but this just sets up some regulations um, regarding speed limits of these and other restrictions for going through neighborhoods um, and setting up some other safety considerations. Um, this bill has passed out of the Senate committee and is now awaiting the uh, Senate caucus for discussion, likely um, followed by a vote. So that concludes at least the state portion. There were a couple of other uh, federal items that I wanted to cover, unless there are any other questions about the state legislative section. Are there any questions on the state legislation? I, I have one question. Wasn't there a new bill that dropped that was going to prohibit uh, government agencies or pseudo government agencies from employing lobbyists? Is that going anywhere? You would be able to employ your own employees to lobby, but you would not necessarily be able to hire lobbyists. I think that was targeted at the League of Cities, but would that also affect PAG and RTA? Yes. Um, you know, I was just looking that up this morning and had it pulled up. I can't remember the number on that one. Um, we are tracking it, though. I can tell you that. And yes, um, it does. It is targeted towards the Arizona City or League of Cities and Towns. There are a couple of other bills that are <laughs> seeking to uh, um, affect that in a way that's not favorable to them. Um, and that would affect PAG as well, um, our county, our cities. Um, so we will see how that goes. But um, the primary target is a League of Cities and Towns. But um, yeah, we will wait. But um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that one and I'll be sure to report next time I uh, yeah. speak to this group. Thank you. Uh, Robin, Robin has her hand up. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Zinda. What a, what a great report. I really appreciate it. It seems like there might be something in writing that at least gives us a go by of uh, the things that you're currently tracking. I'm wondering if we could be provided that so that we don't have to scroll down all our notes or try to remember it. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, members of committee, Ms. Rain, thank you for the question. Uh, I have prepared a list. I've updated the one that was recently sent out with hyperlinks. It takes you straight to the uh, state legislation website, which will provide the status and any other updates and what's going on there. So uh, I'm happy to coordinate with Sonia once again and distribute those um, lists and the hyperlinks in addition to um, some of the websites that I'll mention um, of interest at the federal level. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Federal? Sure, sure. Um, just to put this on your radar, the US code as it pertains to um, some of the highway programs is has been updated at least a couple weeks ago. The Law Revision Council of the House uh, finished that task of not only updating the code with all the changes made by the new IIJA, all 1,000 pages of it, but also updating the footnotes in each section. So when you go and look at it, you can know what changes were made, not only by the IIJ, but also previous law, such as the FAST Act, Map 21, et cetera. So you can find that on uscode.house.gov. And I will be sure, and that's already on my list that um, will eventually be distributed to uh, this committee. Um, and as much as electrical vehicles are concerned, there have been some exciting news. The U.S. Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy have created a joint office of energy and transportation in response to the bipartisan infrastructure law. And this, uh, this office and its accompanying website will provide a lot of support um, for all the programs that seek to deploy a network of electric vehicle chargers, your emission fueling infrastructure, your emission transit and school buses. And you can find that at driveelectric.gov. On that note as well, uh, last week, US DOT and the DOE announced $5 billion available over five years per the bipartisan infrastructure law for the National Electric Vehicle Charging Network. Um, this could provide funding for the alternative fuel corridor plans many states have already developed. Arizona is slated to receive around $11 million in federal fiscal year 2022, pending the approval of state electric vehicle infrastructure deployment plans. 
A second competitive grant program with electric vehicles, um, for which I believe we will be eligible for, um, will be released later this year. So we'll kind of keep an eye out for that. Um, guidance for this formulaic part of the grant, and I suppose eventually for the grant program, is available on the FHW website and certainly driveelectric.org. Finally, um, I would mention um, in a reminder of Ray's grant earlier this um, month, I believe we already sent on email the notice of funding opportunity for the Rebuilding America Infrastructure and Sustainability and Equity or Ray's grant program, which uh, was formerly incarnated under Build and Tiger grants. The deadline for this application is April 14th, 2022. And we would just ask to please let us know if you plan to submit an application, uh, just shoot an email to Carolyn Laurie. With that, if there are no other questions, I think that concludes the legislative updates. Okay, are there any other questions for David on this item? Oh, Paul? Mr. Chair, just a, a point here. Uh, I know that we have our FHWA rep in the room with us and just wanted to see if you would consider giving an opportunity to Romare if there's anything that we're not uh, seeing or including in this federal legislation report that he wants to call to our attention. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Romare Truly, community planner with Federal Highway. Um, I think David's um, presentation was uh, pretty complete. Uh, Federal Highway does have some information on our webpage just generally about IAJA and some changes there. Uh, that's a link that I can provide PAG to distribute to member agencies, but that also goes into some detail to talk a little, a little bit about some of the changes uh, with IAJA compared to past legislation. Mayor, sorry to put you on the spot there. I know that, that uh, Carla and uh, her group uh, has been sharing with the COGS and MPOs has been really valuable. So wanted to provide that opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Ramirez. Uh, if there's no, nothing else in this item, thank you, David. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Next item is item number seven, transportation safety coordination. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is simply an update item. Um, as you recall, your direction at the previous meeting was for PAG staff to coordinate with the Transportation Systems and Safety Subcommittee. Um, we did that uh, initial um, um, orientation with them last Thursday. So essentially we, we set the stage for uh, what uh, we're being challenged with by TPC um, and kind of walk them through uh, just a reminder of the uh, fiscal uh, or the calendar 22 projections that were set for the state and the aspirational goals that we set within our long range planning process. Um, and then we also reminded them of some of the earlier work we did with the 2016 um, regional transportation safety plan and the, uh, the work that was done to identify some of the um, uh, FHWA proven safety countermeasures um, and uh, other strategies that would help address the safety emphasis areas that we had identified uh, as part of that plan effort. So we gave them a good orientation. Uh, their heads didn't spin too much, but um, there's still lots of work ahead. Uh, we also introduced them to some new functionality that we've built within the PAG Safety Explorer tool uh, that uh, more closely links the uh, crash characteristics and the incident uh, details with relative, relevant uh, crash modification factors that come from the National Crash Modification Factors Clearinghouse. So that will be a very helpful um, function uh, as we're looking at the crash causes and details to better link uh, effective strategies that are relevant and can be considered by you all and your staff as we move forward. So we'll continue the conversation with the TSSS group. Um, we're getting oriented internally on how we're going to pull together um, kind of a regional 
um, safety analysis that we can bring back to the TSSS and lead that conversation into what relevant uh, um, safety initiatives and strategies are appropriate for us to uh, uh, put in front of all of you for selection to drive those numbers down. So that's a simple uh, um, update of where we are in that process and uh, happy to answer any questions. And if you have any additional follow-ups, you can always uh, reach out to myself. Rick Ellis is also um, involved in this as is Gabe Thumb and uh, uh, some of our technical folks who have done great work on our Safety Explorer tools. So we're available to field any questions that may be follow-ups for you. Are there any questions for Paul on this item? Uh, Robin. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, really appreciate the follow-up. Um, just had more a comment than a question. I know that in the bill, there are some areas where a Vision Zero plan helps. Is it appropriate for us as a region to have a Vision Zero plan? I, I know that as a jurisdiction, those can be useful, in, especially against the bill, but I wonder if, if that's something we should consider in general. Just a question for comment. Thank you, uh, Robin, for that question, Mr. Chair, uh, members of TPC. I think it's something we should certainly um, give some thought to and give some discussion to. Uh, when we put together the 2016 plan, we did um, try to get into uh, vision, vision zero um, uh, vision statement itself. Um, it's a little bit easier and more appropriate for a local agency to own a vision zero um, vision, as well as strategies that uh, relate or link directly to uh, working towards zero deaths. But that is indeed where we started in 2016. The disconnect is that um, many of the safety initiatives that we serve up for consideration um, are really up to all of you as the implementers. Um, so we would need to try to tighten that relationship a little bit more. It's certainly worth consideration. I think that's where everyone wants to be. Um, but at the same time, I don't think we want it to be something that slows us down on identifying relevant uh, um, strategies that can be pursued uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Are there any further questions? If not, we'll move on to the next item, item number eight, regional transportation revenues, looking at uh, PERF, RTA, and other funding sources. Jamie and slash Jim DeGrood. All right. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. We appreciate the opportunity to speak to this item. And at the last TPC meeting, we heard interest in having a fuller funding picture when we do provide updates on revenues. And so that's why this is a different title. Uh, this is actually a combination of several items. So we're gonna be covering programming considerations, giving even the RTA board and regional council discussions. We're also going to be available to speak to the HERF revenue report as well as the RTA financial update. So David, Nathan, Carolyn are available to speak to the HERF side and, and Jim DeGroote is available to speak to the RTA financial update. And then the memo also includes uh, information about the federal funding obligation authority. And then finally, at the December TPC meeting, we were asked a question about ADOT's HERF forecast. And so we uh, followed up on that. And we have two members of the ADOT staff who are available to answer any questions you might have about their, their forecast process. In the memo, we did include a link uh, to their report from September. And want to thank Catherine Coster and, and Jacqueline Aarons Cook for being here to answer questions on that. So in terms of programming considerations, Many of you are probably following our regional council and RTA board meetings, and you'll know that they're committed to addressing the funding needs to complete the remaining RTA projects. Currently, the funding needs are estimated to be about 78 million to 121 million. And they, the regional council reiterated their commitment to address the completion of the RTA projects using all available funds uh, through the motion of General Maxwell at the January 27th meeting. Uh, which states that the regional council 
will provide official board positions for identifying a proposed plan and funding to complete the projects as part of the original RTA plan and to find the specifics of how to address any RTA projects if they're moved into RTA next. It's important to know that RTA board decisions are necessary before programming funds in the TIP. So many of you are aware that there are some proposals for scope changes to RTA projects that are under consideration by the Technical Management Committee and its uh, Project Review Task Force. So for any changes of work that are approved, um, intergovernmental agreements or IGAs must also be updated and approved. So those steps must occur before we can program in the TIP. So we'll need approved scopes of work and executed IGAs. Again, decisions on which projects to focus on for the current RTA plan versus those compared uh, with what should be carried forward to the RTA next plan are also being uh, considered and must be determined before we can really decide how we're gonna program some funds. There's some other important considerations. RTA revenue projections are updated every three years. And the RTA board approves the annual budget based on the most recent RTA transaction privilege tax revenue projections. In addition to the actuals, updated surface transportation block grants and highway user revenue fund forecasts are developed by ADOT and used in preparation for the TIP development cycle. And PEG will continue to track and provide information on actual performance and revenues of these fund sources. So in the memo for this item, we included some tables of information, again, uh, to be responsive to the request at the last meeting to provide a fuller funding picture. So this is our uh, attempt at doing that. And so we've got three tables here um, that I've also put on screen. Uh, the first table shows fiscal year 2021 actual and federal obligation authority uh, values. So it says year to date at the title, but it should just be actual as it says in the column heading. So we've got on the left, uh, regional HERF 12.6 actual revenue for 2021. To the right, 2.6 uh, actual revenues, RTA actuals, and the federal obligation authority amounts from the federal ledger. The next table shows fiscal year 22 actuals uh, year to date and federal obligation authority. So for HERF 12.6, we're showing the revenues through December. And then for HERF 2.6, the same through December. For RTA, we have year-to-date actuals through January, and then the Federal Obligation Authority uh, is just that static number that we see in the federal ledgers. It's important to note though, um, and as David Zinda has reported with uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, we expect to see an increase in the uh, appropriations to PAG and other MPOs, but we're awaiting an appropriations bill from Congress before we're actually gonna see that reflected in the uh, the ledgers. So we're currently just showing what we're seeing in the ledgers and we'll update that when we do have uh, new numbers. And then the final table at the bottom shows what you would see in the approved tip, fiscal year 22 through 2026 20, tip, in the fiscal constraint table for those different funding sources for fiscal year 22. And with that, again, we've got several staff members as well as uh, guests from ADOT who can help to answer questions on anything that I've covered in my slides or the ADOT HERF uh, forecast or the RTA financial update or the HERF revenue report. So with that, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Could you please back up one slide to where we actually have all the, the numbers and then we'll open up for any questions that anyone may have. Yes, Catherine. Thank you, Keith. So thank you for providing a more comprehensive look at, at all of the funding sources we're looking at. Um, you know, I think we have a challenging year ahead of us as we start looking at the TIP and how are we gonna program the TIP because there's a lot of uncertainty out there and the existing TIP that we're operating from is, is likely missing a significant amount of money from all the sources that we that we show up here, um, what we programmed before. I think we can reasonably expect to, to see in the neighborhood of $200 million more that we need to program when we're looking at the next tip. Um, the other item you mentioned earlier was that funding needs analysis, the shortfall. Um, that's another thing that we'll have to take a close look at. I know that uh, 
other committees, obviously, General Maxwell made a motion and it was approved, I think, unanimously by the RTA board and regional council on how to move forward. Um, so we'll await their direction. But, I, you know, my concern is, is that this is a snapshot. It's not really showing us these deltas. So, you know, we see snippets there. There was a meeting maybe last October where Jim had presented what the shortfalls are and a pessimistic and an optimistic look at there might be 240 million that we can program, there might be 90 million. I think that as a committee, either this committee or, or maybe engaging the TIP committee, to take a much closer look at, at what we reasonably think is out there is going to help inform our opportunities. Maybe we can deliver the program. It seems like there's a significant amount of money out there that we're just not, not really talking candidly about in these open meetings. And then I know the funding needs analysis that was presented at the last RTA board meeting wasn't reflective of the co current cost of our sunset project. I realize it was taking numbers from either the R map or, or some other document. That's another item, either as the TIP subcommittee or this TPC body. I think we really need to make sure we're using current numbers for those so that we're, we're solving the problem we know we have today, not what we estimated things out a few months ago. So, um, I don't have any specific requests here besides, you know, more information, more information, more information. We've been working on trying to make the problem statement more clear for everybody so we know what we're solving. And, and I just, you know, we made a step in the right direction with this table, but it still doesn't show the whole picture. Thank you, Catherine. Robin? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you so much. I have just one thing to add to what Catherine has said. I, I do believe that either this group or the TIP subcommittee would benefit from this data against, somehow set against the projections to complete the projects so that we could have um, some sort of way to at least start the conversation of if we had to do all of the scopes that are in that cost to complete description, how much are we really short based upon current revenue projections? So um, something more along the lines of what we used to do with the all day tip, where we really got into the nitty gritty about how much more we need in order to get where we're going. I know there's a question out there for scope changes that Mr. DeGrood sent out and um, we're, currently working on what our scope changes might be to those um, RTA plan projects, but uh, wonder what the rest of this group feels like. Is it worth going through it with a sort of more fine tooth comb now that we have both the projections of actual uh, funding, either new or, or um, already acquired against those costs complete? Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I would, I would note that uh, it looks like the uh, projected revenues, we're gonna have an easy time beating those, it appears from what we're, where we are with our actuals, especially with HERF. HERF seems, uh, HERF seems way out of whack there, but even the, the current actuals year to dates on uh, uh, the 12.6 and the RTA, looks like we're gonna beat those projections. I'm sorry, the 2-6 looks like it was woefully uh, out of whack there. So. And if I may, Mr. Chair, speak to um, what you're seeing from the bottom table for HERF 2-6. That was adjusted downward to reflect a situation of over-programming that was taking place. There was a misunderstanding of what was uh, produced in the TIP and how that should be interpreted. And what was interpreted as new additional funding was actually not additional funding. So some uh, over-programming was happening with that. Uh, Mark Kaufman, I don't know if you wanted to speak to that, but that's why that number is so low. And if you look at the fiscal constraint table, the, the other years uh, looking at like 24, 25, 26 for her 26, it's you know 5 million, 5 million plus for those years to be, to, as we get out of that over-programming situation and correct that. So I didn't want to just address that. It is, you're right, it is way low, it, lower than it really will be once we normalize. Thank you. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anna? Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
And I just wanted to kind of follow up on Robin's uh, request. She, I think she asked for uh, a really good deep down dive of what is projected. I really do appreciate the information that was sent on the packet, especially the ADOT revenues that go out so many years for the 2-6 and the, and the 12-6. I thought that was really helpful to show us, as Catherine said, based on, on, on her quick calculations, we, there it seems to be a lot of funding that we need to program still and showing that in every year as we work on a program for the next five years, I think will, will be very helpful. And, and really, I think our, our only question was, what can this body, or the TPC, what can we do to help the RTA board come to some decisions? A lot of these, how we move forward, they're based on RTA policies that need to be made by our RTA board. And I know our representative asks us questions um, all the time to help guide their response at these meetings. But I think uh, Robin's request about the details in the deep nine will help inform us so much better so that when our RTA board member comes and asks us questions, we are prepared to then help guide them to make a decision to make these policy decisions because we're getting close to the end and we're still waiting on RTA policy decisions on how we're moving forward. And uh, anything that we can help to move that forward, I think would really help um, get us uh, moving and just moving on direction to get things done instead of thinking about how we're gonna get things done. Robin, is your hand still up from a previous or did you have another question? Um, I just, I heard um, something about a, um, uh, oh, and now I've lost the word, sorry. Um, the table we used to use for, um, uh, for the all day tip uh, constraints. So the, I, I wondered if that was part of the materials. If so, I, I seem to have missed it. So uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Rain, I did refer to a fiscal constraint table in the tip, page 105 of the approved tip. We're just showing fiscal year 22 so that we can have everything in comparison with those recent numbers. But yeah, we can um, direct you to that uh, after this meeting, if you'd like to look at that, or perhaps as part of a future update, if we do this again, we can include more of those, those fiscal years, if that's helpful. Um, but yeah, that might have been what you're referring to is that fiscal, the fiscal constraints. Yeah, yes, fiscal yes, exactly. Yeah. Fiscal okay. and, and I do understand that it's in, in the tip, but I okay. would like to see a fiscal constraints table that um, encompasses what where we actually are because the tip is now fairly old and doesn't doesn't include all of all of these projections at this point, right? Yeah, we're not um, some of this information like the top two tables, that's the latest information we have. It's not reflected in the, the adopted TIF. The, the, only that last table is re reflected in the adopted TIF. Right, I guess that's where I was going is I would oh. like to see an updated one that we could use to start building that deep dive. Uh, Beth? Thank you, Keith. Um, I guess actually my question is more directed towards Catherine, I guess maybe Anna, is that Catherine, can you send the rest of us and maybe peg your numbers? Because we keep talking about these disparities um, in your numbers and what you're seeing versus versus the PAG numbers. But are we all talking, you know, what are we all talking about? And you know, I think it might be easier to figure out where we're not aligning if we can actually see what you're thinking versus what maybe PAG is presenting. Is that something that's possible? Well, I would, if there's gonna be any type of submittal of information, it needs to go from the county to PAG staff to then be disseminated. Otherwise that becomes a meeting law issue. <laughs> right, right. But still that way we're all talking about, Certainly, we can see what everybody's talking about rather than saying, well, I'm seeing something and somebody else saying, well, this is what we have. If we could get those two pieces of information together, it might actually be really helpful to resolve the, the despair. Okay. Sure. Catherine, Thank you had your hand up anyway, so. Yeah, well, I was gonna offer, you know, I can, I, I of course made a spreadsheet. That's how we all calculate these numbers, right? It's very ugly. I, I'd be happy to share it now. That would be open meeting law, but I can also, I, I did start from that constraint table that J 
Jamie was referring to on page 105. So, you know, two six with plugging in the numbers that that were provided in the packet from ADOT and then including what we hadn't programmed for fiscal years 24 through 26, there's a total of $24 million of 2-6 funding available. I did the same thing for the 12-6 using the numbers from the packet that ADOT provided, comparing it to what we programmed. There's 39 million, somewhere between 33 and 39, because it really depends what we spent in 21 when we exceeded that. So, you know, there's, there's some uncertainty. I was just using numbers that I, I could cobble together from the packet. Um, STP, you know, we did a flat 21.5 every year. I don't know how accurate that is for a five-year outlook to think we're just going to have 21,500,000 each year. Obviously, if we just said $3 million from each, each year of the, the infrastructure bill for the last four years, there's $12 million. Um, and, you know, the fiscal constraint table, as it was printed in the tip, there was $77 million of RTV. RTA funds that weren't even programmed in the TIP. Um, and that is using those, those really low revenue estimates. If you increase that, that's probably closer to, I mean, I don't wanna guess, it was, we collected an extra $22 million in 2021. Um, you know, and then I think there was another 29 that they'd already put out that didn't include that 22 million that was in our NOFA. Um, so we're talking about probably $100 million more of RTA. Again, it's, it's hard cobbling together from, from packets what those numbers are, but I'd be glad to provide that to PAG to share. And I think that's what I'm saying. That should be the basis of a TIP meeting. That's, that, that's what that committee used to do. And I don't know if that's an action. Um, I, I guess I'd ask PAG staff, what's your intent for how we're going to kind of walk through this process once we have direction from RTA board? Well, if I may, and I might rely on Jim and others on this, but I, I think we're, at the point of this presentation, we wanted to lead with the programming considerations, right? I know we're, there's a lot of interest in, you know, what are the latest numbers? What can you provide, Peg? And, and when can we start programming some of this? I think what we wanted to really convey is that decisions, some really important decisions need to happen at the highest levels before we can proceed. And then at that point, once those decisions are made, either will be into the next development cycle, or we could provide perhaps a, a notice of funding availability, uh, a supplemental notice of funding availability opportunity um, even sooner than that to release some of those funds for programming. But, you know, I think we wanna share this information with you, but also let you know that we need to make sure that those other processes play out and we get those decisions made so that we actually know what we're, we're trying to program to? What projects are going to be in the current RTA plan versus the next RTA plan? What are those, um, those projects with proposed scope changes? What are those final numbers, for example? And with that, uh, Jim, did you want to add anything else in terms of the RTA perspective? I know different RTA committees are looking at this as well. And so, you know, what is the role of TPC versus TMC and, and the project review task force? For you know, in terms of the role, I think that's something that's somewhat evolving. What we have at this point is some very clear direction uh, from our administration, and it's been uh, articulated to the board as our recommendation, is to look at programming on, on, on an annual basis from funds that we know we've got available to us and can, or can reasonably expect. The uh, There's no question that we're seeing a lot more revenue coming in uh, than we had anticipated at the time of the uh, development of the current tip. And um, for instance, even this, this current fiscal year, I know Catherine, you'd made some projections that uh, you, you thought we would be in the $107 million range, if I recall correctly. We're somewhere in that range. You know, that's no question. You know, we have a budget that was based upon a prior forecast We'll update that and and develop our budget in the future based upon um, the updated forecast that we got from from uh, uh, LR uh, following the the development of the of the budget that we're in right now. But uh, you, you know we're looking at uh, doing uh, successive NOFAs um, and trying to match them up to projects that uh, are ready to go. One of the things that we're very concerned about is that we have a lot of money that's not being utilized. I don't know if you've looked at the RTA fund balance, but 
you know, we're, and that's in the annual report, uh, which anybody can access, but we're probably $165 million in the bank right now. And it's partly because we've got projects that keep rolling over and rolling over and rolling over, and we need to get those projects out on the street. So that's that's one thing that we I think we can all do is is really focus on trying to get these projects uh, ready to go. And if there's funding that we need to to uh, bring forward to advance those projects and develop them, that's that's something that I think we ought to probably be having a conversation about. Um, and that's something that uh, I think. Um, we need to talk about as we're developing the next NOFA. You know, are we uh, are we holding back funds on projects that if we spent a little more on development now, we could get them out sooner? So uh, that's just an observation. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to be looking at uh, the the funds um, that. Um, uh, are actually being realized, and we want to compare it against the best uh, the best cost estimates. Uh, I know, uh, uh, Catherine, you mentioned that that um, you know there's a difference between your estimate for the cost uh, and the cost that we had represented in our table. We we know that you know was uh, that something that uh, hopefully we can get some resolution on very soon. I know we've got a uh, a meeting with uh, uh, county staff tomorrow, and hopefully we can start making some headway on getting some uh, agreed upon numbers that we can represent going forward. Um, one of the things that you know we have also in there is questions about scope, and you know what is it that we are actually paying for, and that may be part of what's driving the difference on the uh, on the uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the Sunset Road project. So we'll deal with that, and as we move forward, we'll be providing updated information. The you know, we'll start out going through the uh, TMC project review working group uh, or project review task force. It'll go through the TMC process because that's the lineage for RTA dollars is, you know, when we look at programming it, you know, we go up through management and uh, through the technical management committee, which, you know, all of you have representation on. And my understanding is that the city and county are getting enhanced representation on as a result of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the motion that happened last uh, uh, last month at the RTA board. And with that, I've probably talked too much. I'll uh, I'll, I'll call, happily uh, address anything else that you bring up, though. Robin. Yes. Um, so that reminds me the question about new NOFAs, uh, the NOFAs that are already in place, especially on the two projects that the city has that are under construction. I don't see a way for us to um, uh, accelerate those. They are already under construction and wondered, it's been quite some time since those NOFAs were out there. And I wanted to ask about a timeline for resolution of those. Do we have one? Um, since uh, one what? of the projects is almost done. <laughs> um, I'm happy to have a conversation with the city offline. I think it would be inappropriate to, you know, address this as it's not an agendaized item to talk about specific projects. So at this point, you know, uh, I will have a conversation with you and it is uh, uh, our expectation to begin dealing with this here very quickly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions on this item? I think, Mr. Chair, I, was say that I think this is a very good first step. I, like Catherine said, I'd like to see more uh, more in depth uh, discussion on in the future and probably seeing how these numbers are arrived at. I think that's a good good uh, request on Catherine's part. And if if she can forward her information then to PAG staff, then PAG can try to reconcile the thought processes between the the two and see where we can uh, come up with some better revenue projections. Jamie. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say, before we move on from this item, I want to thank Mark Hoffman for coordinating with ADOT staff members who are familiar with the ADOT per forecasting process, and they are available to answer any questions about that. Um, thank you to Catherine and Jacqueline. But if there are no questions, that's fine. But I just wanted to acknowledge Mark and, and the two staff members for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Next item is future agenda items. I, I know that there was a, a late request uh, by, I believe it was by, by Anna. There we had the memo that went out regarding the, uh, uh, I guess, a, a, a naughty list for what you can't be putting into uh, PAG reimbursement for a project reimbursement. I think of that in terms of impact fee legislation. That's what we call the things you can't use impact fees for <laughs> is the naughty list. But uh, it didn't make this agenda, but could we place that on the next agenda to discuss that, that memorandum as, as Anna requested? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any other future agenda items? other than normal business. Okay. Yes, Robin. Sorry, a little late. Is it possible to agendize the, um, the deep dive for this or would we, so we can decide whether or not to do it in this committee or in, um, in a, a TIP subcommittee? Would that be a possible agenda okay. item? Which deep dive are you speaking of? To the plan to finalize the RTA project list and funding of the, of the gap. A present, oh, a presentation on the, uh, on the gap on the final projects and what the strategy is at this point? Yes. Okay. I would say presentation and discussion. Okay. Any other items this committee would like to see? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the last item, which is adjournment. We get a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you, PAC staff. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.